Four Non-Canonical Sherlock Holmes Short Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Sherlock Holmes, read by Peter Yearsley. Dr. Watson, read by David Purdy. Herbier de Lernac, read by Algie Pug. James Bland, read by Lewis West. Potterhood, read by James Curran. Inspector Collins, read by Alan Mapstone. James McPherson, read by Charles Conover. St. Helens Station Master, read by Rob Marland. Manchester Station Master, read by Larry Wilson. Collins Green Station Master, read by Twinkle. Earlston Station Master, read by Adrian Stevens. Newton Station Master, read by Lauren Emma. Kenyon Junction Station Master, read by Thomas Peter. Barton Moss Station Master, read by Marvin Bonarescu. James, read by Noel Vox. Edward, read by Thomas Peter. Sparrow McCoy, read by Adrian Stevens. John Palmer, read by Brant Burgess. John, read by Charles Conover. Coroner, read by Lauren Emma. Dude, read by James Curran. Narrator, read by Michelle Eaton. Chapter One of Four Non-Canonical Sherlock Holmes Short Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One, The Field Bazaar. I should certainly do it, said Sherlock Holmes. I started at the interruption, for my companion had been eating his breakfast with his attention entirely centred upon the paper which was propped up by the coffee pot. Now I looked across at him to find his eyes fastened upon me with the half-amused, half-questioning expression which he usually assumed when he felt he had made an intellectual point. Do what? I asked. He smiled as he took his slipper from the mantelpiece and drew from it enough shag tobacco to fill the old clay pipe with which he invariably rounded off his breakfast. A most characteristic question of yours, Watson, said he. You will not, I am sure, be offended if I say that any reputation for sharpness which I may possess has been entirely gained by the admirable foil which you have made for me. Have I not heard of debutantes who have insisted upon plainness in their chaperones? There is a certain analogy. Our long companionship in the Baker Street rooms had left us on those easy terms of intimacy when much may be said without offence, and yet I acknowledged that I was nettled at his remark. I may be very obtuse, said I, but I confess that I am unable to see how you have managed to know that I was, I was... Asked to help in the Edinburgh University Bazaar. Precisely. The letter has only just come to hand, and I have not spoken to you since. In spite of that, said Holmes, leaning back in his chair and putting his fingertips together, I would even venture to suggest that the object of the Bazaar is to enlarge the university cricket field. I looked at him in such bewilderment that he vibrated with silent laughter. The fact is, my dear Watson, that you are an excellent subject, said he. You are never blasé. You respond instantly to any external stimulus. Your mental processes may be slow, but they are never obscure. And I found during breakfast that you were easier reading than the leader in the Times in front of me. I should be glad to know how you arrived at your conclusions, said I. I fear that my good nature in giving explanations has seriously compromised my reputation, said Holmes. But in this case, the train of reasoning is based upon such obvious facts that no credit can be claimed for it. You entered the room with a thoughtful expression, the expression of a man who is debating some point in his mind. In your hand, you held a solitary letter. Now, last night you retired in the best of spirits, so it was clear that it was this letter in your hand which had caused the change in you. This is obvious. It is all obvious when it is explained to you. I naturally asked myself what the letter could contain which might have this effect upon you. As you walked, you held the flap side of the envelope towards me, 
and I saw upon it the same shield-shaped device which I have observed upon your old college cricket cap. It was clear, then, that the request came from Edinburgh University, or from some club connected with the university. When you reached the table, you laid down the letter beside your plate with the address uppermost, and you walked over to look at the framed photograph upon the left of the mantelpiece. It amazed me to see the accuracy with which he had observed my movements. What next? I asked. I began by glancing at the address, and I could tell, even at the distance of six feet, that it was an unofficial communication. This I gathered from the use of the word doctor upon the address, to which, as a bachelor of medicine, you have no legal claim. I knew that university officials are pedantic in their correct use of titles, and I was thus enabled to say with certainty that your letter was unofficial. When, on your return to the table, you turned over your letter and allowed me to perceive that the enclosure was a printed one, the idea of a bazaar first occurred to me. I had already weighed the possibility of its being a political communication, but this seemed improbable in the present stagnant conditions of politics. When you returned to the table, your face still retained its expression, and it was evident that your examination of the photograph had not changed the current of your thoughts. In that case, it must itself bear upon the subject in question. I turned my attention to the photograph, therefore, and saw at once that it consisted of yourself as a member of the Edinburgh University Eleven, with the pavilion and cricket field in the background. My small experience of cricket clubs has taught me that, next to churches and cavalry ensigns, they are the most debt-laden things upon earth. When, upon your return to the table, I saw you take out your pencil and draw lines upon the envelope, I was convinced that you were endeavouring to realise some projected improvement which was to be brought about by a bazaar. Your face still showed some indecision, so that I was able to break in upon you with my advice that you should assist in so good an object. I could not help smiling at the extreme simplicity of his explanation. Of course, it was as easy as possible, said I. My remark appeared to nettle him. I may add, said he, that the particular help which you have been asked to give was that you should write in their album, and that you have already made up your mind that the present incident will be the subject of your article. But how? I cried. It is as easy as possible, said he, and I leave its solution to your own ingenuity. In the meantime, he added, raising his paper, you will excuse me if I return to this very interesting article upon the trees of Cremona, and the exact reasons for the preeminence in the manufacture of violins. It is one of those small outlying problems to which I am sometimes tempted to direct my attention. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Four Non-Canonical Sherlock Holmes Short Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 The Lost Special The confession of Herbert de Lernac, now lying under sentence of death at Marseilles, has thrown a light upon one of the most inexplicable crimes of the century, an incident which is, I believe, absolutely unprecedented in the criminal annals of any country. Although there is a reluctance to discuss the matter in official circles, and little information has been given to the press, there are still indications that the statement of this arch-criminal is corroborated by the facts, and that we have at last found a solution for a most outstanding business. As the matter is eight years old, and as its importance was somewhat obscured by a political crisis which was engaging the public attention at the time, it may be as well to state the facts as far as we have been able to ascertain them. They are collated from the Liverpool papers of that date, from the proceedings at the inquest upon John Slater, the engine driver, and from the records of the London and West Coast Railway Company which have been courteously put at my disposal. Briefly, they are as follows. 
On the 3rd of June 1890, a gentleman who gave his name as Monsieur Louis Caratal desired an interview with Mr James Bland, the superintendent of the London and West Coast Central Station in Liverpool. He was a small man, middle-aged and dark, with a stoop which was so marked that it suggested some deformity of the spine. He was accompanied by a friend, a man of imposing physique, whose deferential manner and constant attention showed that his position was one of dependence. This friend or companion, whose name did not transpire, was certainly a foreigner, and probably from his swarthy complexion, either a Spaniard or a South American. One peculiarity was observed in him. He carried in his left hand a small black leather dispatch box, and it was noticed by a sharp-eyed clerk in the central office that this box was fastened to his wrist by a strap. No importance was attached to the fact at the time, but subsequent events endowed it with some significance. Monsieur Caratal was shown up to Mr Bland's office while his companion remained outside. Monsieur Caratal's business was quickly dispatched. He had arrived that afternoon from Central America. Affairs of the utmost importance demanded that he should be in Paris without the loss of an unnecessary hour. He had missed the London Express. A special must be provided. Money was of no importance. Time was everything. If the company would speed him on his way, they might make their own terms. Mr Bland struck the electric bell, summoned Mr Potter Hood, the traffic manager, and had the matter arranged in five minutes. The train would start in three quarters of an hour. It would take that time to ensure that the line should be clear. The powerful engine called Rochdale, number 247 on the company's register, was attached to two carriages with a guard's van behind. The first carriage was solely for the purpose of decreasing the inconvenience arising from the oscillation. The second was divided, as usual, into four compartments, a first class, a first class smoking, a second class and a second class smoking. The first compartment, which was nearest to the engine, was the one allotted to the travellers. The other three were empty. The guard of the special train was James Macpherson who had been some years in the service of the company. The stoker, William Smith, was a new hand. Monsieur Caratal, upon leaving the superintendent's office, rejoined his companion, and both of them manifested extreme impatience to be off. Having paid the money asked, which amounted to fifty pounds five shillings, at the usual special rate of five shillings a mile, they demanded to be shown the carriage, and at once took their seats in it although they were assured that the better part of an hour must elapse before the line could be cleared. In the meantime, a singular coincidence had occurred in the office which Monsieur Caratal had just quitted. A request for a special is not a very uncommon circumstance in a rich commercial centre, but that two should be required upon the same afternoon was most unusual. It so happened, however, that Mr Bland had hardly dismissed the first traveller before a second entered with a similar request. This was a Mr Horace Moore, a gentlemanly man of military appearance, who alleged that the sudden serious illness of his wife in London made it absolutely imperative that he should not lose an instant in starting upon the journey. His distress and anxiety were so evident that Mr Bland did all that was possible to meet his wishes. A second special was out of the question, as the ordinary local service was already somewhat deranged by the first. There was the alternative, however, that Mr Moore should share the expense of Monsieur Caratal's train and should travel in the other empty first-class compartment if Monsieur Caratal objected to having him in the one which he occupied. It was difficult to see any objection to such an arrangement and yet Monsieur Caratal, upon the suggestion being made to him by Mr Potter Hood, absolutely refused to consider it for an instant. The train was his, he said, and he would insist upon the exclusive use of it. All argument failed to overcome his ungracious objections, and finally the plan had to be abandoned. Mr Horace Moore left the station in great distress, after learning that his only course was to take the ordinary slow train, which leaves Liverpool at six o'clock. At 4.31 exactly, by the station clock, the special train, 
containing the crippled Monsieur Caratal and his gigantic companion, steamed out of the Liverpool station. The line was at that time clear, and there should have been no stoppage before Manchester. The trains of the London and West Coast Railway run over the lines of another company as far as this town, which should have been reached by the special rather before six o'clock. At a quarter after six, considerable surprise and some consternation were caused amongst the officials at Liverpool by the receipt of a telegram from Manchester to say that it had not yet arrived. An inquiry directed to St. Helens, which is a third of the way between the two cities, elicited the following reply. To James Bland, Superintendent, Central London and West Coast, Liverpool. Special passed here at 4.52, well up to time. Douster, St. Helens. This telegram was received at 6.40. At 6.50, a second message was received from Manchester. No sign of special as advised by you. And then ten minutes later, a third, more bewildering. Presume some mistake as to proposed running of special. Local train from St. Helens, time to follow it, has just arrived and has seen nothing of it. Kindly wire advices. Manchester. The matter was assuming a most amazing aspect, although in some respects the last telegram was a relief to the authorities at Liverpool. If an accident had occurred to the special, it seemed hardly possible that the local train could have passed down the same line without observing it. And yet, what was the alternative? Where could the train be? Had it possibly been sidetracked for some reason in order to allow the slower train to go past? Such an explanation was possible if some small repair had to be effected. A telegram was dispatched to each of the stations between St. Helens and Manchester, and the superintendent and traffic manager waited in the utmost suspense at the instrument for the series of replies, which would enable them to say for certain what had become of the missing train. The answers came back in the order of questions, which was the order of the stations beginning at the St. Helens end. Special passed here five o'clock, Collins Green. Special passed here six past five, Earlston. Special passed here five ten, Newton. Special passed here five twenty, Kenyon Junction. No special train has passed here, Barton Moss. The two officials stared at each other in amazement. This is unique in my thirty years of experience, said Mr. Bland. Absolutely unprecedented and inexplicable, sir. The special has gone wrong between Kenyon Junction and Barton Moss. And yet there is no siding, so far as my memory serves me, between the two stations. The special must have run off the metals. But how could the 450 parliamentary pass over the same line without observing it? There's no alternative, Mr. Hood. It must be so. Possibly the local train may have observed something which may throw some light upon the matter. We will wire to Manchester for more information, and to Kenyon Junction with instructions that the line be examined instantly as far as Barton Moss. The answer from Manchester came within a few minutes. No news of missing special. Driver and guard of slow train positive no accident between Kenyon Junction and Barton Moss. Line quite clear, and no sign of anything unusual. Manchester. That driver and guard will have to go, said Mr. Bland grimly. There has been a wreck, and they have missed it. The special has obviously run off the metals without disturbing the line. How it could have done so passes my comprehension, but so it must be, and we shall have a wire from Kenyon or Barton Moss presently to say that they have found her at the bottom of an embankment. But Mr. Bland's prophecy was not destined to be fulfilled. Half an hour passed, and then there arrived the following message from the station master of Kenyon Junction. There are no traces of the missing special. It is quite certain that she passed here, and that she did not arrive at Barton Moss. We have detached engine from goods train, and I have myself written down the line, but all is clear, and there is no sign of any accident. Mr. Bland tore his hair in his perplexity. This is rank lunacy, Hood, he cried. Does a train vanish into thin air in England in broad daylight? The thing is preposterous. An engine, a tender, two carriages, a van, five human beings, and all lost on a straight line of railway. 
Unless we get something positive within the next hour, I'll take Inspector Collins and go down myself. And then at last something positive did occur. It took the shape of another telegram from Kenyon Junction. Regret to report that the dead body of John Slater, driver of the special train, has just been found among the gorse bushes at a point two and a quarter miles from the junction. Had fallen from his engine, pitched down the embankment, and rolled among the bushes. Injuries to his head from the fall appear to be cause of death. Ground has now been carefully examined, and there is no trace of the missing train. The country was, as had already been stated, in the throes of a political crisis, and the attention of the public was further distracted by the important and sensational developments in Paris, where a huge scandal threatened to destroy the government and to wreck the reputations of many of the leading men in France. The papers were full of these events, and the singular disappearance of the special train attracted less attention than would have been the case in more peaceful times. The grotesque nature of the event helped to detract from its importance, for the papers were disinclined to believe the facts as reported to them. More than one of the London journals treated the matter as an ingenious hoax, until the coroner's inquest upon the unfortunate driver an inquest which elicited nothing of importance, convinced them of the tragedy of the incident. Mr Bland, accompanied by Inspector Collins, the senior detective officer in the service of the company, went down to Kenyon Junction the same evening, and their research lasted throughout the following day, but was attended with purely negative results. Not only was no trace found of the missing train, but no conjecture could be put forward which could possibly explain the facts. At the same time, Inspector Collins' official report, which lies before me as I write, served to show that the possibilities were more numerous than might have been expected. In the stretch of railway between these two points, said he, the country is dotted with ironworks and collieries. Of these, some are being worked and some have been abandoned. There are no fewer than twelve which have small gauge lines which run trolley cars down to the main line. These can, of course, be disregarded. Besides these, however, there are seven which have or have had proper lines running down and connecting with points to the main line so as to convey their produce from the mouth of the mine to the great centres of distribution. In every case, these lines are only a few miles in length. Out of the seven, four belong to collieries which are worked out, or at least to shafts which are no longer used. These are the Red Gauntlet, Hero, Slough of Despond, and Heart's Ease Mines the latter having ten years ago been one of the principal mines in Lancashire. These four sidelines may be eliminated from our inquiry, for, to prevent possible accidents, the rails nearest to the main line have been taken up, and there is no longer any connection. There remain three other sidelines leading A. to the Carnstock Ironworks, B. to the Big Ben Colliery, C. To the Perseverance Colliery. Of these, the Big Ben line is not more than a quarter of a mile long and ends at a dead wall of coal waiting removal from the mouth of the mine. Nothing had been seen or heard there of any special. The Camstock Ironworks line was blocked all day upon the 3rd of June by 16 truckloads of hematite. It is a single line and nothing could have passed. As to the Perseverance line, it is a large double line, which does a considerable traffic, for the output of the mine is very large. On the 3rd of June this traffic proceeded as usual. Hundreds of men, including a gang of railway plate layers, were working along the two miles and a quarter which constitute the total length of the line and it is inconceivable that an unexpected train could have come down there without attracting universal attention. It may be remarked in conclusion that this branch line is nearer to St Helens than the point at which the engine driver was discovered, so that we have every reason to believe that the train was past that point before misfortune overtook her. As to John Slater, 
there is no clue to be gathered from his appearance or injuries we can only say that so far as we can see he met his end by falling off his engine though why he fell or what became of the engine after his fall is a question upon which i do not feel qualified to offer an opinion in conclusion the inspector offered his resignation to the board being much nettled by an accusation of incompetence in the london papers a month elapsed during which both the police and the company prosecuted their inquiries without the slightest success a reward was offered and a pardon promised in case of crime but they were both unclaimed every day the public opened their papers with the conviction that so grotesque a mystery would at last be solved but week after week passed by and a solution remained as far off as ever in broad daylight upon a june afternoon in the most thickly inhabited portion of england a train with its occupants had disappeared as completely as if some master of subtle chemistry had volatilized it into gas indeed among the various conjectures which were put forward in the public press there were some which seriously asserted that supernatural or at least preternatural agencies had been at work and that the deformed monsieur caratal was probably a person who was better known under a less polite name others fixed upon his swarthy companion as being the author of the mischief but what it was exactly which he had done could never be clearly formulated in words amongst the many suggestions put forward by various newspapers or private individuals there were one or two which were feasible enough to attract the attention of the public one which appeared in the times over the signature of an amateur reasoner of some celebrity at that date attempted to deal with the matter in a critical and semi-scientific manner an extract must suffice although the curious can see the whole letter in the issue of the third of july it is one of the elementary principles of practical reasoning he remarked that when the impossible has been eliminated the residuum however improbable must contain the truth it is certain that the train left kenyon junction it is certain that it did not reach barton moss it is in the highest degree unlikely but still possible that it may have taken one of the seven available sidelines it is obviously impossible for a train to run where there are no rails and therefore we may reduce our improbables to the three open lines namely the carnstock ironworks the big ben and the perseverance is there a secret society of colliers an english camorra which is capable of destroying both train and passengers it is improbable but it is not impossible i confess that i am unable to suggest any other solution i should certainly advise the company to direct all their energies towards the observation of those three lines and of the workmen at the end of them a careful supervision of the pawnbrokers shops of the district might possibly bring some suggestive facts to light the suggestion coming from a recognised authority upon such matters created considerable interest and a fierce opposition from those who considered such a statement to be a preposterous libel upon an honest and deserving set of men the only answer to this criticism was a challenge to the objectors to lay any more feasible explanations before the public in reply to this two others were forthcoming times july seventh and ninth the first suggested that the train might have run off the metals and be lying submerged in the lancashire and staffordshire canal which runs parallel to the railway for some hundred of yards this suggestion was thrown out of court by the published depth of the canal which was entirely insufficient to conceal so large an object the second correspondent wrote calling attention to the bag which appeared to be the sole luggage which the travellers had brought with them and suggesting that some novel explosive of immense and pulverizing power might have been concealed in it the obvious absurdity however of supposing that the whole train might be blown to dust while the metals remained uninjured reduced any such explanation to a farce the investigation had drifted into this hopeless position when a new and most unexpected incident occurred 
This was nothing less than the receipt by Mrs. Macpherson of a letter from her husband, James Macpherson, who had been the guard on the missing train. The letter, which was dated July 5th, 1890, was posted from New York and came to hand upon July the 14th. Some doubts were expressed as to its genuine character, but Mrs. Macpherson was positive as to the writing and the fact that it contained a remittance of a hundred dollars in five dollar notes was enough in itself to discount the idea of a hoax no address was given in the letter which ran in this way my dear wife i have been thinking a great deal and i find it very hard to give you up the same with lizzie i try to fight against it but it will always come back to me I send you some money, which will change into twenty English pounds. This should be enough to bring both Lizzie and you across the Atlantic, and you will find the Hamburg boats, which stop at Southampton, very good boats, and cheaper than Liverpool. If you could come here and stop at the Johnston house, I would try and send you word how to meet. But things are very difficult with me at present, and I am not very happy, finding it hard to give you both up. So no more at present. From your loving husband, James McPherson. For a time it was confidently anticipated that this letter would lead to the clearing up of the whole matter, the more so as it was ascertained that a passenger who bore a close resemblance to the missing guard had travelled from Southampton under the name of Summers, in the Hamburg and New York liner Vistula, which started upon the 7th of June. Mrs. Macpherson and her sister Lizzie Dalton went across to New York as directed and stayed for three weeks at the Johnston house without hearing anything from the missing man. It is probable that some injudicious comments in the press may have warned him that the police were using them as a bait. However this may be, it is certain that he neither wrote nor came, and the women were eventually compelled to return to Liverpool. And so the matter stood, and has continued to stand up to the present year of 1898. Incredible as it may seem, nothing has transpired during these eight years which has shed the least light upon the extraordinary disappearance of the special train which contained Monsieur Caratal and his companion. Careful inquiries into the antecedents of the two travellers have only established the fact that Monsieur Caratal was well known as a financier and political agent in Central America, and that during his voyage to Europe he had betrayed extraordinary anxiety to reach Paris. His companion, whose name was entered upon the passenger list as Eduardo Gomez, was a man whose record was a violent one and whose reputation was that of a bravo and a bully. There was evidence to show, however, that he was honestly devoted to the interests of Monsieur Caratal, and that the latter, being a man of puny physique, employed the other as a guard and protector. It may be added that no information came from Paris as to what the objects of Monsieur Caratal's hurried journey may have been. This comprises all the facts of the case up to the publication in the Marseille papers of the recent confession of Herbert de Lernac, now under sentence of death for the murder of a merchant named Bonvalot. This statement may be literally translated as follows. It is not out of mere pride or boasting that I give this information, for as that were my object, I could tell a dozen actions of mine which are quite as splendid. But I do it in order that certain gentlemen in Paris may understand that I, who am able here to tell about the fate of Monsieur Caratal, can also tell in whose interest and at whose request the deed was done unless a reprieve which i am awaiting comes to me very quickly take warning messieurs before it is too late you know herbert de lernac and you are aware that his deeds are as ready as his words hasten then or you are lost at present i shall mention no names if you only heard the names what would you not think 
but i shall merely tell you how cleverly i did it i was true to my employers then and no doubt they will be true to me now i hope so and until i am convinced that they have betrayed me these names which would convulse europe shall not be divulged but on that day well i say no more in a word then there was a famous trial in paris in the year eighteen ninety in connection with a monstrous scandal in politics and finance how monstrous that scandal was can never be known save by such confidential agents as myself the honour and careers of many of the chief men in france were at stake you have seen a group of ninepins standing all so rigid and prim and unbending then there comes the bowl from far away and pop 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 there are your nine pins on the floor well imagine some of the greatest men in france as these nine pins and then this monsieur caratal was the bowl which could be seen coming from far away if he arrived then it was pop 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 for all of them it was determined that he should not arrive i do not accuse them all of being conscious of what was to happen there were as i have said great financial as well as political interests at stake and a syndicate was formed to manage the business some subscribed to the syndicate who hardly understood what were its objects but others understood very well and they can rely upon it that i have not forgotten their names they had ample warning that monsieur caratal was coming long before he left south america and they knew that the evidence which he held would certainly mean ruin to all of them the syndicate had the command of an unlimited amount of money absolutely unlimited you understand they looked round for an agent who was capable of wielding this gigantic power the man chosen must be inventive resolute adaptive a man in a million they chose herbert de lernac and i admit that they were right my duties were to choose my subordinates to use freely the power which money gives and to make certain that monsieur caletal should never arrive in paris with characteristic energy i set about my commission within an hour of receiving my instructions and the steps which i took were the very best for the purpose which could possibly be devised a man whom i could trust was dispatched instantly to south america to travel home with monsieur caratal had he arrived in time the ship would never have reached liverpool but alas it had already started before my agent could reach it i fitted out a small arms brig to intercept it but again i was unfortunate like all great organizers i was however prepared for failure and had a series of alternatives prepared one or the other of which must succeed you must not underrate the difficulties of my undertaking or imagine that a mere commonplace assassination would meet the case we must destroy not only monsieur caratal but monsieur caratal's documents and monsieur caratal's companions also if we had reason to believe that he had communicated his secrets to them and you must remember that they were on the alert and keenly suspicious of any such attempt it was a task which was in every way worthy of me for i am always most masterful where another would be appalled i was already for monsieur caratal's reception in liverpool and i was the more eager 
because I had reason to believe that he had made arrangements by which he would have a considerable guard from the moment that he arrived in London. Anything which was to be done must be done between the moment of his setting foot upon the Liverpool Quay and that of his arrival at the London and West Coast terminus in London. We prepared six plans, each more elaborate than the last. Which plan would be used would depend on his own movements. Do what he would, we were ready for him. If he had stayed in Liverpool, we were ready. If he took an ordinary train, an express, or a special, all was ready. Everything had been foreseen and provided for. You may imagine that I could not do all this myself. What would I know of the English railway lines? But money can procure willing agents all the world over, and I soon had one of the acutest brains in England to assist me. I will mention no names, but it would be unjust to claim all the credit for myself. My English ally was worthy of such an alliance. He knew the London and West Coast line thoroughly, and he had the command of a band of workers who were trustworthy and intelligent. The idea was his, and my own judgment was only required in the details. We brought over several officials, amongst whom the most important was James Macpherson, whom we had ascertained to be the guard most likely to be employed upon a special train. Smith, the stoker, was also in our employ. John Slater, the engine driver, had been approached, but had been found to be obstinate and dangerous, so we desisted. We had no certainty that Monsieur Caratal would take a special, but we thought it very probable, for it was of the utmost importance to him that he should reach Paris without delay. It was for this contingency, therefore, that we made special preparations, preparations which were complete, down to the last detail, long before his steamer had sighted the shores of England. You will be amused to learn that there was one of my agents in the pilot boat which brought that steamer to its moorings. The moment that Caratal arrived in Liverpool, we knew that he suspected danger and was on his guard. He had brought with him, as an escort, a dangerous fellow named Gomez, a man who carried weapons and was prepared to use them. This fellow carried Caratal's confidential papers for him and was ready to protect either them or his master. The probability was that Caratal had taken him into his counsel and that to remove Caratal, without removing Gomez, would be a mere waste of energy. It was necessary that they should be involved in a common fate, and our plans to that end were much facilitated by their request for a special train. On that special train you will understand that two out of the three servants of the company were really in our employ, at a price which would make them independent for a lifetime. I do not go so far as to say that the English are more honest than any other nation, but I have found them more expensive to buy. I have already spoken of my English agent, who is a man with a considerable future before him, unless some complaint of the throat carries him off before his time. He had charge of all arrangements at Liverpool, whilst I was stationed at the inn at Kenyon, where I awaited a cipher signal to act. When the special was arranged for, my agent instantly telegraphed to me and warned me how soon I should have everything ready. He himself, under the name of Horace Moore, applied immediately for a special also, in the hope that he would be sent down with Monsieur Caratal, which might, under certain circumstances, have been helpful to us. If, for example, 
our great coup had failed it would then have become the duty of my agent to have shot them both and destroyed their papers caratal was on his guard however and refused to admit any other traveller my agent then left the station returned by another entrance entered the guard's van on the side farthest from the platform and travelled down with macpherson the guard in the meantime you will be interested to know what my movements were everything had been prepared for days before and only the finishing touches were needed the side line which we had chosen had once joined the main line but it had been disconnected we had only to replace a few rails to connect it once more these rails had been laid down as far as could be done without danger of attracting attention and now it was merely a case of completing a juncture with the line and arranging the points as they had been before the sleepers had never been removed and the rails fish plates and rivets were all ready for we had taken them from a siding on the abandoned portion of the line with my small but competent band of workers we had everything ready long before the special arrived when it did arrive it ran off upon the small side line so easily that the jolting of the points appears to have been entirely unnoticed by the two travellers our plan had been that smith the stoker should chloroform john slater the driver so that he should vanish with the others in this respect and in this respect only our plans miscarried I accept the criminal folly of Macpherson in writing home to his wife. Our stoker did his business so clumsily that Slater, in his struggles, fell off the engine, and though Fortune was with us so far that he broke his neck in the fall, still he remained as a blot upon that which would otherwise have been one of those complete masterpieces which are only to be contemplated in silent admiration the criminal expert will find in john slater the one flaw in all our admirable combinations a man who has had as many triumphs as i can afford to be frank and i therefore lay my finger upon john slater and i proclaim him to be a flaw but now i have got our special train upon the small line two kilometres or rather more than one mile in length which leads or rather used to lead to the abandoned heartsease mine once one of the largest coal mines in england you will ask how it is that no one saw the train upon this unused line i answer that along its entire length it runs through a deep cutting and that unless someone had been on the edge of that cutting he could not have seen it there was someone on the edge of that cutting i was there and now i will tell you what i saw my assistant had remained at the points in order that he might superintend the switching off of the train he had four armed men with him so that if the train ran off the line we thought it probable because the points were very rusty we might still have resources to fall back upon having once seen it safely on the side line he handed over the responsibility to me i was waiting at a point which overlooks the mouth of the mine and i was also armed as were my two companions come what might you see i was always ready the moment that the train was fairly on the sideline smith the stoker slowed down the engine and then having turned it on to the fullest speed again he and macpherson with my english lieutenant sprang off before it was too late it may be that it was this slowing down which first attracted the attention of the travellers but the train was running at full speed again before their heads appeared at the open window it makes me smile to think how bewildered they must have been picture to yourself your own feelings if on looking out of your luxurious carriage 
you suddenly perceive that the lines upon which you ran were rusted and corroded red and yellow with disuse and decay what a catch must have come in their breath as in a second it flashed upon them that it was not manchester but death which was waiting for them at the end of that sinister line for the train was running with frantic speed rolling and rocking over the rotten line while the wheels made a frightful screaming sound upon the rusted surface i was close to them and could see their faces caratal was praying i think there was something like a rosary dangling out of his hand the other roared like a bull who smells the blood of the slaughter-house he saw us standing on the bank and he beckoned to us like a madman then he tore at his wrist and threw his dispatch-box out of the window in our direction of course his meaning was obvious here was the evidence and they would promise to be silent if their lives were spared it would have been very agreeable if we could have done so but business is business besides the train was now as much beyond our controls as theirs he ceased owling when the train rattled round the curve and they saw the black mouth of the mine yawning before them we had removed the boards which had covered it and we had cleared the square entrance the rails had formerly run very close to the shaft for the convenience of loading the coal and we had only to add two or three lengths of rail in order to lead to the very brink of the shaft in fact as the length would not quite fit our line projected about three feet over the edge we saw the two heads at the window caratal below gomez above but they had both been struck silent by what they saw and yet they could not withdraw their heads the sight seemed to have paralyzed them i had wondered how the train running at a great speed would take the pit into which i had guided it and i was much interested in watching it one of my colleagues thought that it would actually jump it and indeed it was not very far from doing so fortunately however it fell short and the buffers of the engine struck the other lip of the shaft with a tremendous crash the funnel flew off into the air the tender carriages and van were all smashed into one jumble which with the remains of the engine choked for a minute or so the mouth of the pit then something gave way in the middle and the whole mass of green iron smoking coals brass fittings wheels woodwork and cushions all crumbled together and crashed down into the mine we heard the rattle 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 as the debris struck against the walls and then quite a long time afterwards there came a deep roar as the remains of the train struck the bottom the boiler may have burst for a sharp crash came after the roar and then a dense cloud of steam and smoke swelled up out of the black depths falling in a spray as thick as rain all around us then the vapour shredded off into thin wisps which floated away in the summer sunshine and all was quiet again in the heart's ease mine and now having carried out our plans so successfully it only remained to leave no trace behind us our little band of workers at the other end had already ripped up the rails and disconnected the side-line replacing everything as it had been before we were equally busy at the mine the funnel and other fragments were thrown in the shaft was planked over as it used to be and the lines which led to it were torn up and taken away then without flurry but without delay we all made our way out of the country most of us to paddy my english colleague to manchester and macpherson to southampton whence he emigrated to america let the english papers of that date tell how thoroughly we had done our work and how completely we had thrown the cleverest of their detectives off our track you will remember that gomez threw his bag of papers out of the window 
and I need not say that I secured that bag, and brought them to my employers. It may interest my employers now, however, to learn that out of that bag I took one or two little papers as a souvenir of the occasion. I have no wish to publish these papers, but still it is every man for himself in this world, and what else can I do if my friends do not come to my aid when I want them? Messieurs, you may believe that Herbert de Lernac is quite as formidable when he is against you as when he is with you, and that he is not a man to go to the guillotine until he has seen that every one of you is en route for New Caledonia. For your own sake, if not for mine, make haste, Monsieur de and a general, and a baron. You can fill the blanks for yourselves as you read this. I promise you that in the next edition there will be no blanks to fill. P.S. As I look over my statement, there is only one omission which I can see. It concerns the unfortunate man, Macpherson, who was foolish enough to write to his wife and to make an appointment with her in New York. It can be imagined that when interests like ours were at stake, we could not leave them to the chance of whether a man in that class of life would or would not give away his secrets to a woman. Having once broken his oath by writing to his wife, we could not trust him any more. We took steps, therefore, to ensure that he should not see his wife. I have sometimes thought that it would be a kindness to write to her and to assure her that there is no impediment to her marrying again. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Four Non Canonical Sherlock Holmes Short Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 The Man with the Watches. There are many who will still bear in mind the singular circumstances which, under the heading of the Rugby Mystery, filled many columns of the daily press in the spring of the year 1892. Coming as it did at a period of exceptional dullness, it attracted perhaps rather more attention than it deserved, but it offered to the public that mixture of the whimsical and the tragic, which is most stimulating to the popular imagination. Interest drooped, however, when after weeks of fruitless investigation, it was found that no final explanation of the facts was forthcoming and the tragedy seemed from that time to the present to have finally taken its place in the dark catalogue of inexplicable and unexpiated crimes a recent communication the authenticity of which appears to be above question has however thrown some new and clear light upon the matter before laying it before the public it would be as well perhaps that i should refresh their memories as to the singular facts upon which this commentary is founded these facts were briefly as follows at five o'clock on the evening of the eighteenth of march in the year already mentioned a train left euston station for manchester it was a rainy squally day which grew wilder as it progressed so it was by no means the weather in which any one would travel who was not driven to do so by necessity the train however is a favourite one among manchester business men who are returning from town for it does the journey in four hours and twenty minutes, with only three stoppages upon the way. In spite of the inclement evening, it was therefore fairly well filled upon the occasion of which I speak. The guard of the train was a tried servant of the company, a man who had worked for twenty-two years without a blemish or complaint. His name was John Palmer. The station clock was upon the stroke of five, and the guard was about to give the customary signal to the engine driver when he observed two belated passengers hurrying down the platform. The one was an exceptionally tall man, dressed in a long black overcoat with astrakhan collar and cuffs. I have already said that the evening was an inclement one, 
and the tall traveller had the high, warm collar turned up to protect his throat against the bitter March wind. He appeared, as far as the guard could judge, by so hurried an inspection, to be a man between fifty and sixty years of age, who had retained a good deal of the vigour and activity of his youth. In one hand he carried a brown leather gladstone bag. His companion was a lady, tall and erect, walking with a vigorous step which outpaced the gentleman beside her. She wore a long fawn-coloured dust cloak, a black close-fitting toque, and a dark veil which concealed the greater part of her face. The two might very well have passed as father and daughter. They walked swiftly down the line of carriages, glancing in at the windows, until the guard, John Palmer, overtook them. Now then, sir, look sharp. The train is going, said he. First class, the man answered. The guard turned the handle of the nearest door. In the carriage which he had opened, there sat a small man with a cigar in his mouth. His appearance seemed to have impressed itself upon the guard's memory, for he was prepared afterwards to describe or to identify him. He was a man of thirty-four or thirty-five years of age, dressed in some grey material, sharp-nosed, alert, with a ruddy, weather-beaten face, and a small, closely cropped black beard. He glanced up as the door was opened. The tall man paused with his foot upon the step. This is a smoking compartment. The lady dislikes smoke, said he, looking round at the guard. All right, here you are, sir, said John Palmer. He slammed the door of the smoking carriage, opened that of the next one, which was empty, and thrust the two travellers in. At the same moment he sounded his whistle, and the wheels of the train began to move. The man with the cigar was at the window of his carriage, and said something to the guard as he rolled past him, but the words were lost in the bustle of the departure. Palmer stepped into the guard's van as it came up to him and thought no more of the incident. Twelve minutes after its departure, the train reached Willsden Junction, where it stopped for a very short interval. An examination of the tickets has made it certain that no one either joined or left it at this time, and no passenger was seen to alight upon the platform. At 5.14 the journey to Manchester was resumed, and Rugby was reached at 6.50 the express being five minutes late. At Rugby, the attention of the station officials were drawn to the fact that the door of one of the first-class carriages was open. An examination of that compartment and of its neighbour disclosed a remarkable state of affairs. The smoking carriage in which the short, red-faced man with the black beard had been seen was now empty. Save for a half-smoked cigar, there was no trace whatever of its recent occupant. The door of this carriage was fastened. In the next compartment, to which attention had been originally drawn, there was no sign either of the gentleman with the astrakhan collar or of the young lady who accompanied him. All three passengers had disappeared. On the other hand, there was found upon the floor of this carriage, the one in which the tall traveller and the lady had been, a young man fashionably dressed and of elegant appearance. He lay with his knees drawn up and his head resting against the farther door, an elbow upon either seat. A bullet had penetrated his heart and his death must have been instantaneous. No one had seen such a man enter the train and no railway ticket was found in his pocket. Neither were there any markings upon his linen, nor papers nor personal property which might help to identify him. Who he was, whence he had come, and how he had met his end, were each as great a mystery as what had occurred to the three people who had started an hour and a half before from Willsden in those two compartments. I have said that there was no personal property which might help to identify him, but it is true that there was one peculiarity about this unknown young man, which was much commented upon at the time. In his pockets were found no fewer than six valuable gold watches, three in the various pockets of his waistcoat, one in his ticket pocket, one in his breast pocket, and one small one set in a leather strap and fastened around his left wrist. The obvious explanation that the man was a pickpocket, and that this was his plunder, was discounted by the fact that all six were of American make and of a type which is rare in England. Three of them bore the mark of the Rochester Watchmaking Company, 
one was by Mason of Elmira, one was unmarked, and the small one, which was highly jewelled and ornamented, was from Tiffany of New York. The other contents of his pocket consisted of an ivory knife with a corkscrew by Rogers of Sheffield, a small circular mirror one inch in diameter, a readmission slip to the Lyceum Theatre, a silver box full of Vesta matches, and a brown leather cigar case containing two cheroots, also two pounds fourteen shillings in money. It was clear then that whatever motives may have led to his death, robbery was not among them. As already mentioned, there were no markings upon the man's linen, which appeared to be new, and no tailor's name upon his coat. In appearance he was young, short, smooth-cheeked, and delicately featured. One of his front teeth was conspicuously stopped with gold. On the discovery of the tragedy, an examination was instantly made of the tickets of all passengers, and the number of the passengers themselves was counted. It was found that only three tickets were unaccounted for, corresponding to the three travellers who were missing. The express was then allowed to proceed, but a new guard was sent with it, and John Palmer was detained as a witness at Rugby. The carriage which included the two compartments in question was uncoupled and sidetracked. Then, on the arrival of Inspector Vane of Scotland Yard and of Mr Henderson, a detective in the service of the railway company, an exhaustive inquiry was made into all the circumstances. That crime had been committed was certain. The bullet, which appeared to have come from a small pistol or revolver, had been fired from some little distance, as there was no scorching of the clothes. No weapon was found in the compartment, which finally disposed of the theory of suicide. Nor was there any sign of the brown leather bag, which the guard had seen in the hand of the tall gentleman. A lady's parasol was found upon the rack, but no other trace was to be seen of the travellers in either of the sections. Apart from the crime, the question of how or why three passengers, one of them a lady, could get out of the train and one other get in during the unbroken run between Willesden and Rugby was one which excited the utmost curiosity among the general public and gave rise to much speculation in the London press. John Palmer, the guard, was able at the inquest to give some evidence which threw a little light upon the matter. There was a spot between Tring and Cheddington, according to his statement, where on account of some repairs to the line, the train had for a few minutes slowed down to a pace not exceeding eight or ten miles an hour. At that place it might be possible for a man or even for an exceptionally active woman, to have left the train without serious injury. It was true that a gang of plate layers was there, and that they had seen nothing, but it was their custom to stand in the middle between the metals, and the open carriage door was upon the far side, so that it was conceivable that someone might have alighted unseen, as the darkness would by that time be drawing in. A steep embankment would instantly screen anyone who sprang out from the observation of the navvies. The guard also deposed that there was a good deal of movement upon the platform at Willesden Junction, and that though it was certain that no one had either joined or left the train there, it was still quite possible that some of the passengers might have changed unseen from one compartment to another. It was by no means uncommon for a gentleman to finish his cigar in a smoking carriage and then to change to a clearer atmosphere. Supposing that the man with the black beard had done so at Willesden, and the half-smoked cigar upon the floor seemed to favour the supposition, he would naturally go into the nearest section, which would bring him into the company of the two other actors in this drama. Thus the first stage of the affair might be surmised without any great breach of probability. But what the second stage had been, or how the final one had been arrived at, neither the guard nor the experienced detective officers could suggest. A careful examination of the line between Willesden and Rugby resulted in one discovery which might or might not have a bearing upon the tragedy. Near Tring, at the very place where the train slowed down, there was found at the bottom of the embankment a small pocket testament, very shabby and worn. 
it was printed by the Bible Society of London and bore an inscription. From John to Alice, January 13th, 1856. Upon the flyleaf underneath was written, James, July 4th, 1859. And beneath that again, Edward, November 1st, 1869. All the entries being in the same handwriting, this was the only clue, if it could be called a clue, which the police obtained, and the coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown was the unsatisfactory ending of a singular case. Advertisement, rewards and inquiries proved equally fruitless and nothing could be found which was solid enough to form the basis for a profitable investigation. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that no theories were formed to account for the facts. On the contrary, the press, both in England and in America, teemed with suggestions and suppositions, most of which were obviously absurd. The fact that the watches were of American make and some peculiarities in connection with the gold stopping of his front tooth appeared to indicate that the deceased was a citizen of the United States, though his linen, clothes and boots were undoubtedly of British manufacture. It was surmised by some that he was concealed under the seat and that being discovered, he was for some reason, possibly because he had overheard their guilty secrets, put to death by his fellow passengers. When coupled with generalities as to the ferocity and cunning of anarchical and other secret societies, this theory sounded as plausible as any. The fact that he should be without a ticket would be consistent with the idea of concealment, and it was well known that women played a prominent part in the nihilistic propaganda. On the other hand, it was clear from the guard's statement that the man must have been hidden there before the others arrived, and how unlikely the coincidence that conspirators should stray exactly into the very compartment in which a spy was already concealed. Besides, this explanation ignored the man in the smoking carriage and gave no reason at all for his simultaneous disappearance. The police had little difficulty in showing that such a theory would not cover the facts, but they were unprepared in the absence of evidence to advance any alternative explanation. There was a letter in the Daily Gazette over the signature of a well-known criminal investigator, which gave rise to considerable discussion at the time. He had formed a hypothesis which had at least ingenuity to recommend it, and I cannot do better than append it in his own words. Whatever may be the truth, said he, it must depend upon some bizarre and rare combination of events, so we need have no hesitation in postulating such events in our explanation. In the absence of data, we must abandon the analytic or scientific method of investigation, and must approach it in the synthetic fashion. In a word, instead of taking known events and deducing from them what has occurred, we must build up a fanciful explanation, if it will only be consistent with known events. We can then test this explanation by any fresh facts which may arise. If they all fit into their places, the probability is that we are upon the right track, and with each fresh fact this probability increases in a geometrical progression until the evidence becomes final and convincing. Now there is one most remarkable and suggestive fact which has not met with the attention which it deserves. There is a local train running through Harrow and King's Langley, which is timed in such a way that the express must have overtaken it at or about the period when it eased down its speed to eight miles an hour, on account of the repairs of the line. The two trains would at that time be travelling in the same direction, at a similar rate of speed, and upon parallel lines. It is within every one's experience how, under such circumstances, the occupant of each carriage can see very plainly the passengers in the other carriages opposite to him. The lamps of the express had been lit at Willesden, so that each compartment was brightly illuminated, and most visible to an observer from outside. Now the sequence of events, as I reconstruct them, would be after this fashion. This young man with the abnormal number of watches 
was alone in the carriage of the slow train his ticket with his papers and gloves and other things was we will suppose on the seat beside him he was probably an american and also probably a man of weak intellect the excessive wearing of jewellery is an early symptom in some forms of mania as he sat watching the carriages of the express which were on account of the state of the line going at the same pace as himself he suddenly saw some people in it whom he knew we will suppose for the sake of our theory that these people were a woman whom he loved and a man whom he hated and who in return hated him the young man was excitable and impulsive he opened the door of his carriage stepped from the footboard of the local train to the footboard of the express opened the other door and made his way into the presence of these two people the feat on the supposition that the trains were going at the same pace is by no means so perilous as it might appear having now got our young man without his ticket into the carriage in which the elder man and the young woman are travelling it is not difficult to imagine that a violent scene ensued it is possible that the pair were also americans which is the more probable as the man carried a weapon an unusual thing in england if our supposition of incipient mania is correct the young man is likely to have assaulted the other as the upshot of the quarrel the elder man shot the intruder and then made his escape from the carriage taking the young lady with him we will suppose that all this happened very rapidly and that the train was still going at so slow a pace that it was not difficult for them to leave it a woman might leave a train going at eight miles an hour as a matter of fact we know that this woman did do so and now we have to fit in the man in the smoking carriage presuming that we have up to this point reconstructed the tragedy correctly we shall find nothing in this other man to cause us to reconsider our conclusions according to my theory this man saw the young fellow cross from one train to the other saw him open the door heard the pistol shot saw the two fugitives spring out onto the line realized that murder had been done and sprang out himself in pursuit why he has never been heard of since whether he met his own death in the pursuit or whether as is more likely he was made to realize that it was not a case for his interference is a detail which we have at present no means of explaining i acknowledge that there are some difficulties in the way at first sight it might seem improbable that at such a moment a murderer would burden himself in his flight with a brown leather bag my answer is that he was well aware that if the bag were found his identity would be established it was absolutely necessary for him to take it with him my theory stands or falls upon one point and i call upon the railway company to make strict inquiry as to whether a ticket was found unclaimed in the local train through harrow and king's langley upon the eighteenth of march if such a ticket were found my case is proved if not my theory may still be the correct one for it is conceivable either that he travelled without a ticket or that his ticket was lost to this elaborate and plausible hypothesis the answer of the police and of the company was first that no such ticket was found secondly that the slow train would never run parallel to the express and thirdly that the local train had been stationary in king's langley station when the express going at fifty miles an hour had flashed past it so perished the only satisfying explanation and five years have elapsed without supplying a new one now at last there comes a statement which covers all the facts and which must be regarded as authentic it took the shape of a letter dated from new york and addressed to the same criminal investigator whose theory i have quoted it is given here in extenso with the exception of the two opening paragraphs which are personal in their nature you'll excuse me if i'm not very free with names there's less reason now than there was five years ago when mother was still living but for all that i'd rather cover up our tracks all i can but i owe you an explanation for if your idea of it was wrong it was a mighty ingenious one all the same 
I'll have to go back a little so as you may understand all about it. My people came from Bucks, England, and emigrated to the States in the early 50s. They settled in Rochester in the state of New York, where my father ran a large dry goods store. There were only two sons, myself, James, and my brother, Edward. I was ten years older than my brother, and after my father died, I took the place of a father to him, as an elder brother would. He was a bright, spirited boy, and just one of the most beautiful creatures that ever lived. But there was always a soft spot in him, and it was like mold and cheese, for it spread and spread, and nothing that you could do would stop it. Mother saw it just as clearly as I did, but she went on spoiling him all the same, for he had such a way with him that you could refuse him nothing. I did all I could to hold him in, and he hated me for my pains. At last he fairly got his head, and nothing that we could do would stop him. He got off into New York and went rapidly from bad to worse. At first he was only fast, and then he was criminal, and then at the end of a year or two he was one of the most notorious young crooks in the city. He had formed a friendship with Sparrow McCoy, who was at the head of his profession as a bunco steer, green goodsman, and general rascal. They took to card sharping, frequented some of the best hotels in New York. My brother was an excellent actor. He might have made an honest name for himself if he had chosen. And he would take the parts of a young Englishman of title, of a simple lad from the West, or of a college undergraduate, whichever suited Sparrow McCoy's purpose. And then one day, he dressed himself as a girl, and he carried it off so well and made himself such a valuable decoy that it was their favorite game afterwards. They had made it right with Tammany and with the police, so it seemed as if nothing could ever stop them, for those were in the days before the Lexile Commission, and if you only had a pull, you could do pretty nearly everything you wanted. And nothing would have stopped them if they had only stuck to cards in New York, but they must needs come up Rochester way and forge a name upon a check. It was my brother that did it, though everyone knew that it was under the influence of Sparrow McCoy. I bought up that check, and a pretty sum it cost me. Then I went to my brother, laid it before him on the table, and swore to him that I would prosecute if he did not clear out of the country. At first he simply laughed. I could not prosecute, he said, without breaking our mother's heart, and he knew that I would not do that. I made him understand, however, that our mother's heart was being broken in any case, and that I had set firm on the point that I would rather see him in Rochester jail than in a New York hotel. So at last he gave in, and he made me a solemn promise that he would see Sparrow McCoy no more, that he would go to Europe, and that he would turn his hand to any honest trade that I helped him to get. I took him down right away to an old family friend, Joe Wilson, who is an exporter of American watches and clocks, and I got him to give Edward an agency in London, with a small salary and a 15% commission on all business. His manner and appearance were so good that he won the old man over at once, and within a week he was sent off to London with a case full of samples. It seemed to me that this business of the check had really given my brother a fright, and that there was some chance of him settling down into an honest line of life. My mother had spoken with him, and what she said had touched him, for she had always been the best of mothers to him, and he had been the great sorrow of her life. But I knew that this man Sparrow McCoy had a great influence over Edward, and my chance of keeping the lad straight lay in breaking the connection between them. I had a friend in the New York detective force, and through him I kept a watch upon McCoy. When, within a fortnight of my brother's sailing, I heard that McCoy had taken a berth in the Etruria, I was as certain as if he had told me that he was going over to England for the purpose of coaxing Edward back again into the ways that he had left. In an instant I had resolved to go also and to pit my influence against McCoy's. I knew it was a losing fight, but I thought, and my mother thought, that it was my duty. We passed the last night together in prayer for my success, and she gave me her own testament that my father had given her on the day of their marriage in the old country, so that I might always wear it next my heart. I was a fellow traveler on the steamship with Sparrow McCoy, and at least I had the satisfaction of spoiling his little game for the voyage. The very first night I went into the smoking room, found him at the head of a card table, with a half dozen young fellows who were carrying their full purses and their empty skulls over to Europe. He was settling down for his harvest, and a rich one it would have been, but I soon changed all that. Gentlemen, said I, are you aware whom you are playing with? What's that to you? You mind your own business, said he with an oath. Who is it, anyway? asked one of the dudes. He's Sparrow McCoy, the most notorious card sharper in the States. Up he jumped with a bottle in his hand, but he remembered that he was under the flag of the effete old country, where law and order run. 
and Tammany has no pull. Jail and the gallows wait for violence and murder, and there's no slipping out by the back door on board an ocean liner. Prove your words, you, said he. I will, said I. If you will turn up your right sleeve to the shoulder, I will either prove my words, or I will eat them. He turned white and said not a word. You see, I knew something of his ways, and I was aware of that part of the mechanism which he and all such sharpers use consists of an elastic down the arm with a clip just above the wrist. It is by means of this clip that they withdraw from their hands the cards which they do not want, while they substitute other cards from another hiding place. I reckoned on it being there, and it was. He cursed me, slunk out of the saloon, and was hardly seen again during the voyage. For once, at any rate, I got level with Mr. Sparrow McCoy. But he soon had his revenge upon me, for when it came to influencing my brother, he outweighed me every time. Edward had kept himself straight in London for the first few weeks, and had done some business with his American watches, until this villain came across his path once more. I did my best, but the best was little enough. The next thing I heard, there had been a scandal at one of the Northumberland Avenue hotels. A traveller had been fleeced of a large sum by two Confederate card sharpers, and the matter was in the hands of Scotland Yard. The first I learned of it was in the evening paper, and I was at once certain that my brother and McCoy were back at their old games. I hurried at once to Edward's lodgings. They told me that he and a tall gentleman, whom I recognized as McCoy, had gone off together, and that he had left the lodgings and taken his things with him. The landlady had heard them give several directions to the cabman, ending with Euston Station, and she had accidentally overheard the tall gentleman saying something about Manchester. She believed that that was their destination. A glance at the timetable showed me that the most likely train was at five, though there was another at 4.35 which they might have caught. I had only time to get the later one, but found no sign of either of them at the depot or in the train. They must have gone on by the earlier one, so I determined to follow them to Manchester and search for them in the hotels there. One last appeal to my brother by all that he owed to my mother might even now be the salvation of him. My nerves were overstrung, and I lit a cigar to study them. At that moment, just as the train was moving off, the door of my compartment was flung open, and there were McCoy and my brother on the platform. They were both disguised and with good reason, for they knew that the London police were after them. McCoy had a great astrakhan collar drawn up, so that only his eyes and his nose were showing. My brother was dressed like a woman, with a black veil half down his face, but of course it did not deceive me for an instant, nor would it have done so even if I had not known that he had often used such a dress before. I started up, and as I did so, McCoy recognized me. He said something, the conductor slammed the door, and they were shown into the next compartment. I tried to stop the train so as to follow them, but the wheels were already moving, and it was too late. When we stopped at Williston, I instantly changed my carriage. It appears that I was not seen to do so, which is not surprising as the station was crowded with people. McCoy, of course, was expecting me, and he had spent the time between Euston and Williston in saying all he could to harden my brother's heart and set him against me. That is what I fancy, for I had never found him so impossible to soften or to move. I tried this way and I tried that. I pictured his future in an English jail. I described the sorrow of his mother when I came back with the news. I said everything to touch his heart, but all to no purpose. He sat there with a fixed sneer upon his handsome face, while every now and then Sparrow McCoy would throw in a taunt at me, or some word of encouragement to hold my brother to his resolutions. Why don't you run a Sunday school? He would say to me, and then in the same breath, He thinks you have no will of your own. He thinks you're just the baby brother, and that he can lead you where he likes. He's only just finding out that you're a man as well as he. It was those words of his which set me talking bitterly. We had left Williston, you understand, for all this took some time. My temper got the better of me, and for the first time in my life I let my brother see the rough side of me. Perhaps it would have been better had I done so earlier and more often. A man, said I. Well, I'm glad to have your friend's assurance of it, for no one would suspect it to see you like a boarding school missy. I don't suppose in all this country there is a more contemptible-looking creature than you are as you sit there with that dolly pinafore upon you. He colored up at that, for he was a vain man, and he winced from ridicule. It's only a dust cloak, said he, and he slipped it off. One has to throw the coppers off one's scent, and I had no other way to do it. He took his toque off with a veil attached, and he put both it and the cloak into his brown bag. Anyway, I don't need to wear it until the conductor comes round, said he. Nor then either, said I, and taking the bag I slung it with all my force out of the window. Now, said I, you'll never make a Mary Jane of yourself while I can help it. 
If nothing but that disguise stands between you and a jail, then to jail you shall go. That was the way to manage him. I felt my advantage at once. His supple nature was one which yielded to roughness far more readily than to entreat. He flushed with shame and his eyes filled with tears. But McCoy saw my advantage also and was determined that I should not pursue it. He's my pard, and you shall not bully him, he cried. He's my brother, and you shall not ruin him, said I. I believe a spell of prison is the very best way of keeping you apart, and you shall have it, or it will be no fault of mine. Oh, you would squeal, would you? He cried, and in an instant he whipped out his revolver. I sprang for his hand, but saw that I was too late, and jumped aside. At the same instant he fired, and the bullet which would have struck me passed through the heart of my unfortunate brother. He dropped without a groan upon the floor of the compartment, and McCoy and I, equally horrified, knelt at each side of him, trying to bring back some signs of life. McCoy still held the loaded revolver in his hand, but his anger against me and my resentment towards him had both for the moment been swallowed up in this sudden tragedy. It was he who first realized the situation. The train was for some reason going very slowly at the moment, and he saw his opportunity to escape. In an instant he had the door open, but I was as quick as he, and jumping upon him, the two of us fell off the footboard and rolled in each other's arms down a steep embankment. At the bottom I struck my head against a stone, and I remembered nothing more. When I came to myself, I was lying among some low bushes, not far from the railroad track, and somebody was bathing my head with a wet handkerchief. It was Sparrow McCoy. I guess I couldn't leave you, said he. I didn't want to have the blood of two of you on me hands in one day. You loved your brother, I've no doubt. But you didn't love him a cent more than I loved him, though you'll say that I took a queer way to show it. Anyhow, it seems a mighty empty world now that he is gone, and I don't care a continental whether you give me over to the hangman or not. He had turned his ankle in the fall. And there we sat, he with his useless foot, and I with my throbbing head, and we talked and talked until gradually my bitterness began to soften and turn into something like sympathy. What was the use of revenging his death upon a man who was as much stricken by that death as I was? And then as my wits gradually returned, I began to realize also that I could do nothing against McCoy, which would not recoil upon my mother and myself. How could we convict him without a full account of my brother's career being made public? The very thing which of all others we wished to avoid. It was really as much our interest as his to cover the matter up, and from being an avenger of crime I found myself changed to a conspirator against justice. The place in which we found ourselves was one of those pheasant preserves which are so common in the old country, and as we groped our way through it I found myself consulting the slayer of my brother as to how far it would be possible to hush it up. I soon realized from what he said that unless there were some papers of which we knew nothing in my brother's pockets, there was really no possible means by which the police could identify him or learn how he had got there. His ticket was in McCoy's pocket, and so was the ticket for some baggage which they had left at the depot. Like most Americans, he had found it cheaper and easier to buy an outfit in London than to bring one from New York, so that all his linen and clothes were new and unmarked. The bag containing the dust cloak, which I had thrown out of the window, may have fallen among some bramble patch, where it is still concealed, or may have been carried off by some tramp, or may have come into the possession of the police, who kept the incident to themselves. Anyhow, I have seen nothing about it in the London papers. As to the watches, they were a selection from those which had been entrusted to him for business purposes. It may have been for the same business purposes that he was taking them to Manchester, but, well, it's too late to enter into that. I don't blame the police for being at fault. I don't see how it could have been otherwise. There was just one little clue that they might have followed up, but it was a small one. I mean, that small circular mirror which was found in my brother's pocket. It isn't a very common thing for a young man to carry about with him, is it? But a gambler might have told you what such a mirror may mean to a card sharper. If you sit back a little from the table and lay the mirror face upwards upon your lap, you can see as you deal every card that you give to your adversary. It's not hard to say whether you see a man or raise him when you know his cards as well as your own. It was as much a part of a sharper's outfit as the elastic clip upon Sparrow McCoy's arm. Taking that in connection with the recent frauds at the hotels, the police might have got hold of one end of the string. I don't think there's much more for me to explain. We got to a village called Amersham that night in the character of two gentlemen upon a walking tour, and afterwards we made our way quietly to London, whence McCoy went on to Cairo and I returned to New York. 
Her mother died six months afterwards, and I am glad to say that to the day of her death she never knew what happened. She was always under the delusion that Edward was earning an honest living in London, and I never had the heart to tell her the truth. He never wrote, but then he never did write at any time, so that made no difference. His name was the last upon her lips. There's just one other thing that I have to ask you, sir, and I should take it as a kind return for all this explanation, if you could do it for me. You remember that testament that was picked up? I always carried it in my inside pocket, and it must have come out in my fall. I value it highly, for it was the family book with my birth and my brothers marked by my father at the beginning of it. I wish you would apply at the proper place and have it sent to me. It can be of no possible value to anyone else. If you address it to X, Bassano's Library, Broadway, New York, it is sure to come to hand. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Four Non-Canonical Sherlock Holmes Short Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four: How Watson Learned the Trick. Watson had been watching his companion intently ever since he had sat down to the breakfast table. Holmes happened to look up and catch his eye. Well, Watson, what are you thinking about? He asked. About you. Me? Yes, Holmes. I was thinking how superficial are these tricks of yours, and how wonderful it is that the public should continue to show interest in them. I quite agree, said Holmes. In fact, I have a recollection that I have myself made a similar remark. Your methods, said Watson severely are really easily acquired. No doubt. Holmes answered with a smile. Perhaps you will yourself give an example of this method of reasoning. With pleasure, said Watson. I am able to say that you were greatly preoccupied when you got up this morning. Excellent, said Holmes. How could you possibly know that? Because you are usually a very tidy man, and yet you have forgotten to shave. Dear me, how very clever, said Holmes. I had no idea, Watson, that you were so apt a pupil. Has your eagle eye detected anything more? Yes, Holmes. You have a client named Barlow, and you have not been successful with his case. Dear me, how could you know that? I saw the name outside his envelope. When you opened it, you gave a groan and thrust it into your pocket with a frown on your face. Admirable! You are indeed observant. Any other points? I fear, Holmes, that you have taken to financial speculation. How could you tell that, Watson? You opened the paper, turned to the financial page, and gave a loud exclamation of interest. Well, that is very clever of you, Watson. Any more? Yes, Holmes. You have put on your black coat instead of your dressing gown, which proves that you are expecting some important visitor at once. Anything more? I have no doubt that I could find other points, Holmes, but I only give you these few in order to show you that there are other people in the world who can be as clever as you. And some not so clever, said Holmes. I admit that they are few, but I am afraid, dear Watson, that I must count you among them. What do you mean, Holmes? Well, my dear fellow, I fear your deductions have not been so happy as I should have wished. You mean that I was mistaken? Just a little that way, I fear. Let us take the points in their order. I did not shave, because I have sent my razor to be sharpened. I put on my coat, because I have, worse luck, an early meeting with my dentist. His name is Barlow, and the letter was to confirm the appointment. The cricket page is beside the financial one, and I turned to it to find if Surrey was holding its own against Kent. But go on, Watson, go on. It's a very superficial trick, and no doubt you will soon acquire it. End of chapter 4 End of four non-canonical Sherlock Holmes short stories by Arthur Conan Doyle